the main purpose is to sort of point out which are the parts of digital systems that you need to be aware of in order to understand some of the terminology and concepts I'll be talking about in this course. So first things first, this at least, you know, you have done it. The only likely problem you have is that, you know, you did it so long ago that you have forgotten this stuff. But you know, it's easy to review, so don't worry about it. Boolean logic, right, essentially refers to things where we are treating everything as either true or false values, equivalently ones and zeros, right? And the idea is that we can basically use certain kinds of logic gates, right? And or not. Uh, and incidentally, the NAND gate is considered a universal gate, right? Because using NAND, you can then create all the other types of gates that you want. Okay? So these logic gates, essentially what they do is, for example, they would take something like, you know, the AND gate would have something like two inputs, X and Y, and give you an output Z, and it would have some kind of a truth table that sort of describes its behavior, right? What should Z be as a function of X and Y? Okay. Now, there are various different ways by which I can represent basic digital systems. The first and sort of most the simple form is so-called Boolean equation, right? Where I can basically, so these are the equations as essentially corresponding to what we would call a full adder, right? So the full adder can be thought of as a hardware unit that basically takes in three inputs, each is one bit, right? So the AI and BI are two values that you want to add and the CI is the corresponding uh, carry in at that particular stage. What it generates as output is a sum and a carry output, right? So uh, rather than AI and BI, you could think of it as just A and B, right? And uh, CO is the carry output, okay? So this is a simple way of sort of looking at what a full adder should do, okay? Another equivalent way is using something called a truth tip. So here what we say is these are the inputs A, B and C, I and these two are the outputs, right? And what we can say is for every combination of A, B, C, what should the outputs look like, okay? These two are of course completely equal, right? They refer to exactly the same thing and in fact going from one to the other is also fairly straightforward. You could then take this and convert it into a schematic an actual circuit level description, which involves using gates, right? Now, the interesting thing here is, this schematic is a faithful reproduction of the truth table and the Boolean equations, right? So you can see that basically I'm using the XOR function to first do A X or B, and then afterwards combining it with the XOR function for C, uh, CI to get the final output S. And as far as the CO output is concerned, I first and all the inputs in some way that I want and then pour them together using a three input or gate. Okay. So this is perfect, right? The truth table, the schematic in other words, faithfully represents the truth table, but this is not unique, right? What I mean by not unique is there could be other combinations of gates that would give me exactly the same behavior as the truth table and the Boolean equation that I've shown you over there. On the other hand, the Boolean equation and the truth table are completely equivalent. You can't have a different truth table for the same equations. Okay. So, all right. With this, the next thing that we are, we need to sort of know a little bit about in this course is, how do you actually realize these gates at the transistor level? Okay. Now, once again, if you have not done a course on digital IC design, I would not panic. Uh, you don't need to know too much about it. You only need to think of these things essentially as switches, right? So the PMOS transistor is a certain type of switch. The NMOS transistor is also another type of switch. All that happens is, right, you have VDD, which is basically the supply voltage. You have one switch over here. You have another switch over here. And this goes to ground and there is an output. This is connected to the input A in such a way that I, you know, I mark the top switch as a sort of negative polarity switch. A equal to zero means that this is closed, right? 
Whereas, when A is equal to 1, this is closed. Okay, so the two switches have sort of opposite polarities. They close at different times. At other times, they are open. Right? And based on this, you can sort of work out the logic over here. Basically, when A is equal to 1, this will be closed, which means that there is now a path, right? Uh, y gets pulled down to 0. Okay? On the other hand, when A is equal to 0, this is closed, right? Which means that Y will get pulled up to PDD. Okay? So these are the two options that we can basically deal with over here. By looking at transistors purely as switches, we can basically see what the functionality looks like. Which means that if I now look at this other uh, circuit that I've shown over here, right? Essentially what I can see is I have two inputs A and B. And now if both A and B are equal to 1, it means that both of these are closed. Right? And the output will get pulled down to 0. Right? And if any one of them, either A or B or both, are equal to 0, it means that the pull down path right, versus the pull up path, the pull up path, at least one of the two transistors will be active and will pull Y up to ADD. Whereas the pull down path will be turned off because at least one of those two transistors is off and they are in series which means that any one of them being off is the same as both being off. That, that, that path has been cut. Okay. So this is how we can construct CMOS circuits out of transistors. Right? So they implement exactly the same gates that we have. The thing to keep in mind over here is because you are making these out of transistors, what ends up happening is that each of those transistors is now a physical object. Right? It has a certain capacitance because of its size, because of various uh, physical and chemical properties associated with it. It also has a capability of delivering a certain current because there is a potential difference across it. And based on you know certain other control signals, some current can flow through the transistor. The size of the transistor determines two things. One is its capacitance and the other is how much current can flow through. Okay. And that becomes important later when we are talking about the performance of the system. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, what I showed you over there were so-called combinational elements. The idea of a combinational element is the output at any given point in time is uniquely determined just by the values of the inputs and nothing else. A sequential element, on the other hand, has some kind of memory, right? And what I mean by memory is, let's consider this element on top, right? The one that I've uh, drawn with the C as the input. I can think of this C as some kind of a control or a clock signal, right? I call it a clock because that is how it is typically connected in practice, right? And what happens with the clock signal is, with this symbol over here, this essentially means that it is an edge triggered element right? and what happens in an edge triggered element is every time that clock signal undergoes a transition from 0 to 1 it takes whatever was the value of D and copies it out to Q. Okay, You can see that over here. Initially the value of Q over here is in fact unknown. I have just drawn a hatched line over here to indicate that it is unknown or invalid. I, I really, I simply don't know what the value is. D on the other hand is coming in over here. But even though I know the value of D, I can't say what the value of Q is until I have seen the first clock edge. Right? This is a clock edge. And so is this. Right? These are so called positive edges of the clock. Right? Which are transitions from 0 to 1. Negative edges would be from 1 to 0. So what happens at the first positive edge of the clock is I look at the value of D and copy that value out into Q. That's why I know that after that edge of the clock, Q has the value 0. 
Now D continues to change, right? It changes multiple times over here, but I ignore all of them until I get to the next edge of the clock, at which point, once again, I go and look at the value of D. Now it turns out that it has the value one, which is why I change Q to one. Okay. A slight contrast, this one over here is level triggered, the second symbol that I have drawn. In the case of a level triggered uh, latch, right, which is usually the term that we use, this gate signal, right, which is also in some kind of a control signal, whenever that becomes one, this is when the latch is active. Okay. So any changes that happen on D whenever the gate is active will pass through to the output. That's what you see over here, right? Anything in this range passes through. And similarly, over here, once again, it is active when the gate signal becomes high. Right? So you can see the difference in Q. If you look at Q, you'll notice the difference between the edge triggered and level triggered systems. In the case of the level trigger, there can be multiple changes that happen at the output. In the case of edge trigger, the change can happen only at the edge. Now, there are multiple terms that are used for such systems. Register usually refers to one or more bits that are edge triggered. Okay. A latch is typically level triggered. Memory, on the other hand, right, in general, is can be thought of as a collection of a large number of registers or latches, right? And the most important part is that typically this is of high capacity, meaning that I'm talking about thousands of bits of storage capacity rather than just one or two bits here or there. Right? Now, what this means is that by having these sequential elements, I have managed to separate out the way by which I can separate the time instant at which the output can change from just whenever the inputs can change. Only one of the inputs controls exactly when the output will change. The other input controls what it will change into. Okay, And this becomes very important because it allows us to sort of implement something called a state machine. Right? In a state machine, what we have is there is there are two parts. There is a sequential part over here and there is a combinational part out here. Okay. And the combinational parts work is basically to implement whatever logic I want. Okay. But the sequential part sort of retains my state. It allows me to say this is what I am currently doing. Now based on the inputs, this is how I need to evolve. Okay. This is a very powerful concept. right? And it is used, it, it's sort of the building block of pretty much any kind of digital system that is non-trivial. Okay. Examples, of course, in a digital systems course, you would probably come up with something like a traffic light controller, but pretty much anything, right? I mean, you can have an Ethernet Mac controller that you might have to design would be implemented as a state machine. And the point is, any kind of CPU, a processing unit, is some kind of a programmable state machine. It basically has registers which retain its state. And it also has the ability to read in instructions, which are inputs coming from a memory block. And based on its present state plus the state of the memory, it can then evolve into the next state. Okay. So the state machine concept is a very powerful idea and forms the basis of a lot of hardware design. As we go further, and especially when we start looking at how Vivado HLS implements designs in practice, we'll see that you know at the, at the core of the system, there are always going to be state machines that control how the system uh, behaves in practice. Okay. Now, like I said, one of the important parts of what you need to understand as far as timing is concerned, right, there is this issue of the so-called setup and hold time. Okay. And I want to briefly uh, review that because it's a uh, one of the things which a lot of people sometimes have uh, difficulty with. The thing that you need to keep in mind over here is because all of these sequential elements are ultimately built up out of physical uh, units, right, transistors and so on, there is also always some kind of uh, an uncertainty window associated with all the signals that are present, right. There is some 
amount of time that it takes a signal to go through a piece of hardware. What that means is if this is the location of my edge, my clock edge, right? I have a certain window around it during which I don't want the data to change, right? So my D in is allowed to change over here. and is again allowed to change over here if necessary but in the middle it must not change at all okay so what do i mean by must not change at all essentially what it means is that if the d in changes too close to the clock edge either just before the clock edge or just after the clock edge, there is a possibility that the data that actually gets stored inside the register or the flip-flop will not be what you wanted it to be. Okay? The flip-flop, I mean, there are multiple terms that are used for this. The flip-flop can become metastable. It can essentially, uh, you can have race conditions. You can, uh, the, the bottom line is that you can no longer trust whether the data that is present at the output of the flip-flop is what you actually intended it to be. Okay. Now, what that means is from the perspective of timing, I just need to make sure that this window around my clock edge does not see any change in data. How do I ensure this? As a designer, I need to make sure that the signals, whatever it is that is coming into the flip-flop, must stabilize a certain amount of time before the clock edge can come. And the flip-flops or registers should also be constructed in such a way that there should be no change in data until a certain amount of time has passed after the clock edge. Okay. So these two things are very important and form the core of any kind of timing analysis that we do in a system. Okay. Now, I am showing this from the perspective of a single flip-flop, but where it becomes interesting is when you take it further and go to multiple, uh, multiple uh, flip-flop and multiple gate systems. An example is over here, right? So what I have over here is both of these, this Q1 and Q2 are flip-flops, right? Those are the sequential elements present in my circuit. And, what I, and the way that I have connected it is both of them are connected to the same clock, right? What that means is the clock signal itself will be some kind of, you know, uh, square wave with maybe 50% duty cycle, it may or may not, I don't really care. The point is I'm only interested in these edges of the clock, right? And I want to know what happens at those edges of the clock. Every time that there is an edge of the clock, some data will come through the flip-flop from input to output, right? And will then proceed to go through the system in some way, right? So, This signal, for example, will go through this U1, it will go through U2, and in fact, it will come back to the previous case, right? On the other hand, the signal coming out of Q2 would go through a longer path, it could basically end up going through U0, and now it has two different choices, not choices, I mean, it actually goes through both of them. One of them is to go through U3 and out to Y. Another one is to go through U1 and to Q1 and yet another one is to go through U1 and then U2 and then all the way back to where it started from. Right? So what you can see from here is these signals because of the way that they are connected, the output of a flip-flop then passes through multiple other elements and comes back either to the same flip-flop or goes into the input of another flip-flop. Right? And remember that at every flip-flop, I need to make sure that these constraints that I had shown over here are properly satisfied, right? I don't have any setup and hold violations. How do I manage something of that sort? I can assume the only thing that is really in my control is the clock period and to some extent also the connections and perhaps the delays of different elements that I have, okay? So in this context of timing analysis, I actually have multiple different things that I can 
try and check right there are many different uh, parts to what is important over here i have one path through the data which basically goes directly from input to output and i call this the combinational detail the pin to pin combinational detail right but i could also have a uh, concern about what happens to this data whenever x changes right ultimately it goes through some gates and ends up at the inputs of both the flip flops right this is the so called input to clock setup delay right and what it means is that when i have a clock that is going to arrive at a certain time on a flip flop i need to also know at what time the inputs are allowed to change in such a way that they don't mess up the data which is actually going to get stored into the flip flop right similarly i also have a situation where i could have the value from q2 going all the way through this and going out this is the clock to output delay okay so there are all these different variants that i need to be concerned with that i need to actually keep in mind when i'm doing timing analysis so if i take a specific set of examples right these numbers over here i have a setup time let's say for each of these flip flops which is 2 nanoseconds right a hold time of 1 nanosecond a clock to q output delay of 3 nanoseconds and the various combinational elements have their own delays associated with them okay if i ask you these questions right what is the combinational delay the pin to register delay register to pin and register to register and finally based on all of those can you give me the minimum clock period okay this is an important question that all of you should be able to answer it's not that we will be directly using this in the context of timing analysis but when you go through for example reports that come out of high level synthesis you will find that there are many places where you know it mentions a certain critical path or it mentions that this is the delay and we need to understand what is it for the most part we are going to be concerned only with this register to register delays but the other things also are important to keep in mind right there you need to understand that in the context of overall uh, analysis of the larger system okay so i'm just going to go through let's say one of the paths over here so if we look at the combinational delay for example what i can say is that i have 2 nanoseconds corresponding to u0 and 1 nanosecond corresponding to u3 right and that is the only path that i have which goes directly without passing through any other flip flops from input to output okay so what that means is the combinational delay here is 3 nanoseconds okay now let me straight away skip through to a register to register delay there are multiple register to register delays that paths that i have over here right let me just briefly mark those one of them for example is from the output of q1 going through a register and back to q1 okay another path goes through this but now goes here u2 and comes back to q2 okay so from q1 if i say what are the paths that lead me to other registers right these are the two paths in this particular instance okay but that's not the end of the story i could also have something from q2 going through u0 then through u1 back to q1 or i could also have something which goes from q2 through u0 through u1 through u2 back to q2 and finally i could also have something which goes from q2 through all of this but now through u3 and then u2 back to q2 okay so the point i'm trying to make with all of these sort of colored lines over here is that there are many different paths that you might need to consider when you are trying to go from a flip flop or a register 
to other parts of the circuit back to another register. Okay. In this case, if we go through the uh, analysis, what we find is that ultimately the longest of these paths is going to be the one which goes from Q2 out to U0, then to U1, then to U2 and back to Q2. What is the delay through this? This has TCQ, right? Because I need to first go out from the clock to the output of this flip-flop plus the AND gate U1 is a XOR gate U2 is also an XOR gate and Q2 what is this that I need to be concerned about? The setup time. Okay. All of this needs to be taken into account which means that I will basically end up with 3 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2 equal to 13 nanoseconds as the path length that I go through the entire chain and come back. Okay. In this particular instance, as far as I know, this is the longest such chain. Okay. Why am I concerned with the longest such chain? Because I need to make sure that for every possible combination of register to register paths, I will guarantee that there is no setup or hold time violation. I have not looked at hold times of course, I am looking only at setup time. So let me just say there is no setup time violation right now. Okay. What I am going to do is I will leave it over here. I want all of you to basically go through this exercise and try and find out what would be the a clock minimum, right? The minimum clock period that can be used on the system without causing any setup or hold violations. Okay. Please make sure that you are able to understand this part of it. And what I would suggest is for those who are not clear, we can discuss this over the email mailing list, right? Uh, if necessary, I can have a separate session to cover this in a little bit more detail. But it, I, ideally, it is something that you know you should be able to also, I think, cover on your own. Okay. Uh, there is a reference on static timing analysis that I have already linked on Moodle. You can go through that. There is also some, you know, the textbooks on digital IC design and so on. We'll also talk a little bit about it. But at the end of the day, it is also, uh, you know, you basically need to look at it from the point of view of what kind of constraints need to be satisfied by such a system and is there any chance uh, of a setup violation as a result of the signals that you are considering. Okay. Two more things that I wanted to uh, quickly touch upon. One of them is related to the problem of uh, timing, right? And like I said, you know, the this is basically a question of how fast a, mo a capacitance can charge or discharge. What do I mean by that? The circuit that I've drawn over here essentially corresponds to a inverter, right? The NOT gate. And what I am showing over here is this is the capacitance of the so-called load, right? So if I have two transistor, two inverters connected one to the other, this one is called the driver and this one is called the load. Okay. The load capacitance, in other words, is also going to be caused by the fact that there is some transistor connected over there and you know this signal will be basically connected to the input of some other transistor. Now what ends up happening in a situation like this is in practice when let's say the input has a negative transition from 1 to 0, the output is going to try and rise from 0 to 1. How does that happen? The PMOS transistor turns on right, and some current flows from VDT into that load capacitance, okay? which is what I have drawn over here. This is basically the current flowing from VDT into the load capacitance, right? And over time, this will basically charge up towards VDT, right? This will be the voltage as a function of time, okay? Now, this current is basically 
when you do the computation or uh, you look at the transistor models, one way of looking at it is that it comes out as something proportional to E minus VT the whole squared. Right? As a simplifying assumption, if I take the, uh, if I assume that this constant current is trying to charge up this CL, the load capacitance, from 0 up to V, then I can basically infer that the total charge that is being deposited on the capacitance Q is equal to C into V. The current that is being used over here is this value, right? K into V minus Vt the whole squared, which means that the amount of time required for charging, right? Essentially, it is a situation where I'm saying that it's going to charge at a constant rate. And then once it reaches VDD, it basically stops. Okay, so this is sort of an approximation to this curve, to the actual exponential that you are likely to see. It's just assuming a constant current followed by stop. I'm trying to find out how much time this is. This is the value T. Right? And it's going to be basically given by C into V by K into V minus VT the squared. What this means is when voltage increases, what happens to time? This is going to decrease. Right? Higher voltage, less delay, which basically means faster. Okay? And this is the sort of core point that I sort of uh, just wanted to uh, mention over here. The Typically, for such circuits, when you run at a higher voltage, the entire system just runs faster. Okay? That sounds good because it means that I can make a circuit run faster by just increasing the supply voltage. The problem that happens is the next thing which is related to power consumption. Once again, the same story, right? I have two inverters. The capacitance of this is basically the load capacitance. This is the driver, right? And what ends up happening as a result of this is, once again, I have this picture where, you know, some constant current is feeding into this. What is, now, where is energy or power coming into the picture? The moment that I have some voltage and a current flowing through it, it means that there is power being drawn out of the source. Okay. And in this case, what I can say is that the energy, right, is basically the integral of that power over time. Right. This is the total charging time for the load capacitance, the time that it took to go from 0 up to VDD, which means that this VD into I of T DT can be rewritten. I of T can be written as C dV by DT. Right? And I can do a sort of change of variables over here and end up with an integral from 0 to VDD, C dV by DT. Right? And when I do the math, basically what I find is that during one transition, right? that is to say, when the, uh, when the voltage on the load capacitance is going from 0 to VDD, an amount of energy equal to C VDD squared is pulled out of the supply and deposited onto and part of it is deposited onto the capacitance another part of it is just dissipated as heat in the BMOS transistor okay and whatever is deposited onto the capacitance what happens to that after some time I will go through another negative transition right during which time my signal will go from 1 to 0 current will flow through the NMOS transistor and go down uh, and uh, basically take the voltage back down to zero, right? At which point there will be some energy dissipated inside the NMOS transistor, right? Which means that during one full cycle, that is to say output voltage goes from 0 to 1 and then back down to 0 
this much C DDD squared energy is dissipated, right? Meaning that it's essentially lost. There is nothing you can do about it. It is just burnt. Part of it was burnt in the BMOS, part of it was burnt in the NMOS, right? And there is no way that you can re recover this energy. So what does this tell us? It means that a higher value of VDD is bad news, right? More power consumption. It also tells us that a large value of C, a large capacitance or in general a large circuit is also bad news because that will also lead to a higher power consumption. 